Welcome, everyone. Um, we'll just get started, um, but folks who are getting lunch, please feel free um, to finish up um, and others uh, refresh your plates as you like. Um, so welcome. My name is Jessica Field. I'm the Assistant Director of the Cyberlaw Clinic um, here at the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this event is being um, webcast live and recorded for our website. Um, so both in terms of your consent for participating in that, but also um, there will be opportunities for questions at the end. So just make sure um, if you ask a question, please um, wait for the microphone so folks online um, can hear you. Um, if you want to comment on social media or live tweet, please use the hashtag um, BKC Harvard. And um, one last announcement, we just added a new event for next Monday. Amanda Askell from OpenAI will be here um, giving a lunch talk on competitive AI development um, without collection, collective action programs. Um, so that looks to be totally fascinating. Hope you can join us. Um, maybe you can get in a question or two about their GPT-2 tool that they um, are not releasing um, since there'll be someone from uh, OpenAI on the hot seat. So uh, as for today, um, the Berkman Klein Center has been has a long history of involvement at the intersection of digital technologies and human rights, um, essentially as long as there has been an intersection of those things. Um, and so we're very delighted to be welcoming today um, David Sullivan, who's the Director of Learning and Development at the Global Network Initiative, to address some key questions um, and tell us some juicy stories about this space. Um, questions like, how can advocates, activists, and academics work with technology companies to advance human rights? And how do we properly do that? Is When is a public name and shame um, campaign a more effective mechanism versus a confidential conversation? David's experience answering these questions in partnership with tech companies range from situations involving conflict minerals and hardware supply chains to fighting censorship and surveillance online with organizations um, from the Center for American Progress and the International Rescue Committee. He'll talk um, about these questions and share stories for about 20 minutes. We will then welcome um, Berkman Klein fellow Chinmay Arun, who is uh, assistant professor of law at the National University of Delhi and the founding director of the Center for Communication Governance um, to engage in discussion with David for a little bit. Um, and then I will pop back up to help moderate your questions. So please save those for the end. Uh, join me in welcoming David Sullivan. So um, thank you, uh, Jess, for the very kind introduction. And thanks to everybody from the Berkman Klein Center for the opportunity to be here today. Um, working with Berkman faculty, staff, uh, fellows, associates, students, interns, um, has been a highlight of my time at the Global Network Initiative, but all done from far away. So I'm happy to be here with folks today uh, and really looking forward to the, to the discussion. Um, just for those of you who might be unfamiliar, so I work at the Global Network Initiative, which brings together technology companies with human rights groups, press freedom groups, socially responsible investors, and academics uh, to work on a common approach to freedom of expression and privacy online and sort of resisting government pressure to enlist companies in censorship and surveillance. Um, but today, I'm going to start with a story um, from a previous uh, experience working on uh, conflict minerals from Eastern Congo. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my remarks brief to save time for conversation, but I'm going to tell you how I got to find myself across the table uh, from Steve Jobs in Cupertino talking about human rights, um, highlight a few points from that conversation that have uh, wider relevance, I think, to the digital rights community, uh, and then we can really get into it in the discussion. So um, yeah, the second half of my career sort of working with technology companies on tough human rights issues really came out of the first half of my career, which was working on humanitarian aid, uh, relief and development, and peace and security with a focus on the African continent. And um, in 2008, I started working at the Enough Project at the Center for American Progress, um, which was working to try to influence US policy uh, in support of peace in Eastern Congo and other conflict zones in Africa. And I should say that the multiple conflicts sort of across the Democratic Republic of Congo are deeply complicated and really outside the scope uh, of this lunchtime talk. Um, but it, uh, enough, we worked with um, field researchers uh, based on the ground, including Congolese researchers, 
to study the conflict dynamics and try to identify sort of points of leverage where the United States could change its policies in support of peace. Uh, and then we, uh, so we took that field analysis and we worked together with um, advocacy groups here in the United States uh, from grassroots student groups, faith-based organizations, uh, investors, uh, and even a few celebrities, as you can see from the photographer uh, for the book that uh, actually this story uh, was recently published in, uh, Congo Stories by my colleagues Fidel Bathalumba and John Prendergast, um, which I recommend is a good entry point into studying uh, Congo's very fascinating and complicated history. Um, so uh, in 2009, so roughly 10 years ago, um, our field, field research had zeroed in on a previously neglected dimension of this crisis. Um, much of Eastern Congo's vast mineral wealth was uh, fueling the conflict, uh, enriching armed groups, whether it was kind of rebel groups or unaccountable elements of the Congolese army, all of whom were perpetrating horrific violence against people uh, on the ground there. Uh, and the most lucrative of natural resources, um, these minerals, gold, tin, tantalum, and tungsten, uh, which we call the three T's, um, would flow from mines that were in some cases controlled by armed groups um, through trading routes, which were taxed uh, by armed groups or army units, um, to traders in the major cities in the region, um, out to mostly to Asia, uh, to processing and smelting facilities, where they would then enter into all kinds of supply chains, um, but particularly those for high-tech uh, electronics and hardware. So these are the four conflict minerals that we talked about. Um, tin is uh, commonly used as a solder on circuit boards. Um, tungsten has a wide variety of kind of industrial applications, but interestingly enough, it's used for the vibration function um, on cell phones. Uh, tantalum uh, is a store, uh, stores electricity, uh, holds a charge, is used in capacitors that are used in kind of every type of electronic gadget. Um, and gold uh, is often in wiring, uh, as well as being used for jewelry kinds of things. Um, one thing uh, today, there's a lot of concern about cobalt, um, which is essential for batteries uh, and which uh, Congo has very high uh, reserves of. Um, but at the time that we were working on this, uh, the regions where the conflict was taking place was not the regions where cobalt was mined. So it was not kind of included in this work, but uh, there's been a lot of work done on this issue and a lot of companies are also looking at cobalt supply chains the way they're looking at these mineral supply chains. So um, we looked into this and we looked into what companies were doing. And we found that, this, that companies were aware of this link uh, between the conflict in Congo and their products. Um, but few had really done more than post vague written assurances on their corporate social uh, responsibility website saying that they instructed their suppliers not to source from Congo or not to source conflict minerals. Um, but there wasn't any uh, independent verification or follow up uh, to ensure that that was true. And so what we did was uh, started a multi-pronged campaign to encourage both government and company action on this issue. Um, so we pushed for legislation uh, that had bipartisan support that was going to mandate company supply chain due diligence, uh, and which was eventually actually passed as part of the 2010 uh, Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Bill. Um, and we also campaigned publicly and privately with companies, uh, encouraging them to take action themselves to sort of trace and audit their supply chains. Um, now at the time, uh, technology companies were really dealing with this issue through an industry association. That was a bit of a word salad, the Electronics Industry Citizenship Coalition, Global E-Sustainability Initiative Working Group on Supply Chains or something like that. Um, and um, while uh, common industry action was important, uh, we were worried that, that outsourcing this to an industry association could sort of result in a response that would be incommensurate to the urgency of the issue and kind of allow for a lowest common denominator approach where uh, many companies could sort of free ride uh, on the work of the few companies that were really leading the work of this industry association. So what we did was we wrote to 21 leading consumer electronics companies uh, seeking individual meetings and commitments from them. Um, and companies responded in a wide variety of different ways. Uh, Intel and Hewlett Packard very quick to contact us and to work with us and to, to take things forward. Other companies, Nintendo, didn't come around for years. We didn't really hear from them. Um, Apple, sort of the subject of today, uh, was squarely in the middle of the pack. Um, so they were members of this industry association, uh, but they weren't particularly active in it. Uh, and once our campaigning sort of started to get some traction, we heard from their government relations team in Washington, D.C., 
They said, oh, we care about this. You know, could you maybe tell us where we should and shouldn't be getting our minerals from, which seemed kind of odd. They wouldn't take a position on the legislation, said they don't take position on legislation across the board. And so we sort of felt like we were being managed. But because they took the same position as all of the other companies in the industry, it was hard to kind of single them out as being particularly good or bad. Um, and so that changed uh, in early 2010. Um, when an activist uh, named Lisa Shannon, um, who is a, a now a, a Kennedy School graduate and Carr Center fellow, um, she protested uh, outside of a bunch of tech company headquarters across uh, Silicon Valley and the West Coast. And she went to Apple headquarters, where a PR person told her, um, Apple doesn't use conflict minerals. Our suppliers certify that they are clean. Um, and so with those words, the company kind of stepped away from what had been this kind of agreed position, oh, this is a tough problem and we need an industry-wide solution. Uh, and that kind of opened the space for us to do uh, a little bit more sort of concerted uh, advocacy really targeting Apple. Um, and so uh, we had, um, well, student groups that we were working with protested the um, opening of the Apple Store in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. Um, a video that we developed spoofed the old kind of, I'm an Apple, I'm a PC ads, uh, and pointed out that both uh, contain conflict minerals. Um, Nick Kristoff covered this in the Times, uh, and our legislation was moving forward on Capitol Hill, so it was kind of unprecedented success. Um, so at the time, Steve Jobs uh, had, was back in the CEO position, uh, and some folks will remember that he was in the habit of um, responding to emails uh, sent to his email address, which was kind of widely known and available, sjobs at apple.com. And every time he did it, it would trigger a news cycle about whatever it was that he was responding to or speaking out about. Uh, and so um, uh, this person, Derek, wrote to him uh, and asked about conflict minerals, and he responded uh, and said, yes, you know, we, uh, you know, we certify, but we, until there's a way to chemically trace these things, uh, it's, it's a very difficult problem. So this was all across the technology press. Uh, and so you know, uh, our team, we were trying to figure out, what do we do? Is there some way we can, could we reach out to this Derek guy and get him to respond? Or what, what, what should we do? And we settled on uh, the idea that we would write um, Steve Jobs ourselves and, and tell him our arguments for why we think that there is something that could be done here. Um, so uh, we crafted this email, uh, and uh, I sort of hit send on it, uh, not really expecting to ever particularly uh, hear back from him. <laughs> but um, And then the following day, actually, we were, it was a very busy day in DC. We were doing a panel event with the Congolese ambassador of Congress, someone from the State Department. And I was kind of freaking out because all our speakers weren't at the event yet. And I sort of look at my phone, and um, I see this email uh, <laughs> that says, you know, I'm happy to chat with your CEO. <laughs> uh, so after our event, kind of, we gather the team and are in a completely giddy state and are like, oh my God, what are we gonna do about this? We got way ahead of ourselves, had drafted up a like multi-page response to a one-line email. Um, and um, so I get back to my desk after this long day and I see that I've missed a call. And so my phone just says, missed call, Apple. And um, I'm like, all right, this is probably someone from their DC office or from their communications office calling to sort of follow up or to be not happy with what was going on. And so I was like, all right, I should just call them back. And so I call back and this voice is like, hello? And I was like, oh, this is David Sullivan from Enough returning uh, your call. And he's like, yeah, you got Steve Jobs. I told you I'd speak to your CEO. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> and uh, so um, fast forward a couple days um, and uh, um, uh, some colleagues of mine, my, my boss, John Pendergast, we got, uh, back, get on the phone with, with Steve. We call him on his, on his iPhone. He picks up. And um, he, the conversation did not go well. He started to uh, berate us for criticizing Apple, uh, claimed that we were doing that because our legislation had stalled uh, and characterized our ideas as stupid. Um, and uh, we, we didn't take the bait, um, but we all, and we didn't back down. And we said, actually, you know, uh, the bill that we've been supporting was actually moving forward. It had been rolled into the Obama administration's Signature Wall Street Reform Act. So if that was passing, this was passing in it. Uh, and that actually, you know, we think that not only do we have these ideas about how you can trace your supply chains, but other companies um, are supportive of them as well. And I think particularly when we said that Intel was working on it, he was like, that's a company I respect. 
Okay. And so he was far from convinced, but he said, you know, I'll read a memo and we'll take it from there. So we put our ideas into writing. Uh, and um, uh, a few weeks later, we wound up going out to Cupertino um, for a meeting with Steve Jobs and Tim Cook uh, and a number of other uh, senior Apple executives. Um, so let me just stop right now and say, if you are going to a meeting at Apple headquarters, don't bring a PowerPoint presentation that is frowned upon. <laughs> it does not go well. It does not get things off to a great start. <laughs> um, despite that, <laughs> we made an initial presentation of our ideas uh, to do for companies to do this human rights uh, due diligence by auditing their supply chains, having independent uh, audits uh, of the supply chains, and supporting the creation of a certification scheme, which would sort of allow for minerals to be ethically and responsibly sourced from Congo. Um, so uh, Steve Jobs was still skeptical, uh, and the conversation that ensued was combative at times and collaborative at times. But um, I'm sort of telling the story because I think there were four moments from it that stood out that sort of were interesting to me as someone who's been working with technology companies on human rights, um, which I hope can be sort of the basis for talking about how to do this in the digital rights space um, later uh, in the session today. So um, the first point was about how to get companies kind of to pay attention, how to get companies on the hook to do something about a given issue. And so um, shortly after we finished our presentation, uh, Steve said, you know, I, I don't, uh, don't want to have to give a shit about this. If I have to start caring about this issue, I have to start caring about every other issue under the sun, every other conflict under the sun. And so while I, while I personally thought that maybe it would be good for him to care about Congo as well as all of these other things, um, we countered that the issue here was directly connected, directly linked uh, to Apple's supply chain and to their products and services. Um, and that the success and innovation of Apple you know, didn't have a direct connection to peace in the Middle East, but it did have a connection back to these um, mining communities in Eastern Congo that were ravaged by conflict. Uh, and so in the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, um, this is what's called uh, conducting human rights due diligence. Uh, and it's where a company is supposed to identify and assess the nature of the actual and potential adverse human rights impacts with which a business enterprise may be involved. Um, and the key distinction between human rights due diligence and other sort of company corporate risk management work is this is about risks to people, not risks to the business. Um, and uh, when a company kind of is assessing human rights uh, risks and impacts, they're supposed to look to see whether they caused um, a certain human rights violation, um, contributed to it, um, or were directly linked to it via their products or a business relationship. Um, and so while this discussion with Steve Jobs was happening sort of contemporaneously with when John Ruggie was developing the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, um, I think it's a good example of how you can use that kind of approach because we said you're directly linked to these things. What you need to do if you're directly linked to a human rights abuse through your supply chain is to generate some leverage to try to stop uh, the, the violation or the adverse impact. And so we argued that if you are to map your supply chains back to the sources and then be able to use your commercial leverage to have folks who are supplying you do their due diligence, um, you can help contribute uh, to, to resolving the situation. And that's kind of what happened. So um, uh, the second point is sort of knowing when you've, <laughs> when you've succeeded to, to an extent. And so Steve Jobs, he told us that Apple did more than anybody to map their supply chains, that they were an industry leader, and that we should be thankful for all the work that they were doing there. And he then went off on a little bit of a screed about uh, Greenpeace. And Greenpeace had previously ranked uh, com tech companies on environmental concerns. And he was saying that Greenpeace's rankings were dumb, their criteria was bad, uh, he didn't, wouldn't listen to anything that Greenpeace had to say. They just went ahead and made the greenest computer that had ever been made. Uh, and so again, I didn't say anything, but I was thinking to myself, wow, Greenpeace really was effective in <laughs> inculcating some change here. Um, and uh, then right there on the spot, he sort of agreed, OK, Apple's going to map their supply chains all the way back to the mines if possible. They're going to identify all of the smelters and processors um, that they work with, and they're going to sort of go for it. And it was kind of a game-changing moment and because uh, uh, they had just committed to the sort of first two parts of our three-part ask. They were going to trace and audit their supply chains. And then he was kind of like, all right, so 
you know, what else are we not doing that you think we should be doing? Um, and at this point, I had been quiet in the meeting, letting my, my boss and others uh, do a lot of the talking. But I was like, you know, I really want to try to push for this certification mechanism that was a th our third part. It would really help on the ground. Uh, and I said, you know, what about that? And he just kind of looked at me and was like, now that is a stupid fucking answer. <laughs> I just told you that I'm going to do, you know, what you want me to do, and then I'm not going to do that, and then you ask me to do it again anyway. <laughs> and um, so despite being, you know, on the receiving end of, of a certain amount of fury there, um, we recognized that, that we had, you know, kind of um, accomplished an enormous amount. Um, so um, uh, at that point, um, you know, uh, another uh, issue that came up was sort of secrecy and transparency. And so we could have gone public about this meeting right after it happened. I think that probably would have brought even more attention to the issue than was already there. Um, but it sort of went against um, uh, an approach that Steve Jobs went on about uh, in the meeting, saying Apple doesn't, uh, doesn't talk about what it's going to do. It does things, and then it talks about them. And he was very critical of our approach, seeking commitments from companies of what they would commit to do in the future. He said, do it, and then get it done. Uh, and so um, by not uh, talking about the meeting and by keeping things secret, we created a kind of confidential space where we could continue to work with Apple's supply chain teams and to sort of uh, figure this out. And that, to me, is similar to a lot of the work that we do at the Global Network Initiative, where we provide this safe space for internet and telecoms companies to work with academics and NGOs and others. Um, it's a different approach, you know, it's, it's one thing to be um, the organization that says we're going to, you know, uh, be public and identify the issue that a company needs to deal with and then it's on the company to resolve it. Um, it to work behind the scenes, you actually have to problem solve working with the company. Some people may feel like, you know, that's for the company that created this issue to do. We're just going to bring it to them and they should fix it. I think it's good to have an ecosystem of kind of accountability organizations and activists where there's room for different types of approaches at different times. So um, the last point that I want to make uh, is that, um, you know, we were doing this inside and outside game where we were sort of working uh, with bringing policy expertise and field research to activists and advocates, and we were trying to bring a bit of activist energy to sort of insider policy debates. Um, one part of that was we were planning to do a ranking of company performance uh, on conflict minerals. And uh, this was one issue where things were not copacetic at the end of our meeting. Apple was really unhappy with this ranking. They wanted to decline to participate. Uh, one executive told us uh, that the ranking was too focused on areas that do not result in real cha uh, change uh, and could prevent the teamwork needed across the industry um, to drive action. Um, so, you know, we explained to Apple that the rankings were going to be based on publicly available information. They could decline to participate, but they, but that, they were still going to be ranked. Uh, and so, um, actually, in the rankings that we did right after this, they were in the middle of the pack because the changes we had talked about with uh, Steve Jobs and his team hadn't been reflected yet. And it wasn't until a subsequent 2017 ranking uh, that the organization did long after I had moved on um, that they sort of moved up to the top. Um, I don't know if anybody in the room is familiar with who's worked on the Ranking Digital Rights Project that Rebecca McKinnon is working on, um, but I think folks who are uh, who have worked on that uh, will recognize the skepticism from companies about rankings. There's a lot of companies, even ones that land at the top of these kinds of things, that do not like them uh, and feel that they they uh, that they do not uh, encourage kind of collaboration within the industry. But I think that you need a mix of competition and collaboration. So when you look at sort of tech issues and digital rights, you see companies competing with each other uh, to be more transparent in things like transparency reports and things like that, and innovations <laughs> that fire up the competitive instincts of these companies that are really fiercely competing with each other can be valuable. Um, so whether it's ranking digital rights or uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation's gold stars for their who has your back report, these things do motivate companies, I, I think, more than anything. But you also need that cross-industry collaboration. Uh, in our meeting, Tim Cook sort of pointed out, listen, we need the industry um, to work on conflict minerals because you need to aggregate leverage in the supply chain to be able to go to these middlemen and say that you need to change your ways. Um, so we've tried to do, we tried to do both um, at enough, and we've tried to... Um, foster that collaborative environment within the Global Network Initiative uh, while still allowing other actors out there to kind of work on the ranking and the competing 
aspect. So um, the struggle for security and human rights in Eastern Congo uh, very much continues today. The Cong Congolese people are the ones who are leading the drive for uh, peace and democracy. You cannot solve a conflict in North and South Kivu from a boardroom in Cupertino, uh, but you can sort of start to change some of the see no evil kind of calculations that allowed us all to sort of unknowingly kind of you know, contribute to fueling this conflict based on our sort of desire to have the latest technology at the lowest possible prices. Uh, the, the work that we did was a combination of uh, a great deal of luck, uh, even more privilege, uh, and the talents of a really uh, fantastic team uh, of uh, researchers, activists, grassroots groups. Um, uh, so it, it's very much not my accomplishment, it is theirs and it is far from done and the people who are continuing to work on these issues today uh, are, you know, kind of, uh, deserve a lot of admiration and support. Um, I hope this uh, helps us kind of think about corporate accountability in other sectors and in other spaces, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion with uh, Chinmay and with all of you. Thanks. themselves in front of Mark one day. Um, you told that story in a very self-deprecating way, uh, but I also felt like it was an illustration of the importance of strategic silence sometimes. And from that point of view, I wonder if you could discuss this tension between calling out and collaborating when you're negotiating with the likes of Steve and Mark. Yeah, no, I think, and it, 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 uh, to me, I think it's important because I do think that... Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, sure. Let's, is this better? Okay. Um, I think that uh, uh, increasingly, uh, in order to really kind of make uh, change uh, in the technology industry and with uh, tech companies, um, we can sort of push from the bottom up, but there also needs to be that uh, uh, connection at the top and to really sort of drive, drive home the point to the senior most executives and investors across the sort of technology space of the importance of human rights. Uh, and um, I commend the Berkman Klein Center for, for sort of you know, fostering those discussions. Um, I think it's a, tough, uh, it's a tough call to make. We, we used kind of every tool in the kind of activist arsenal to get the attention of senior people. Uh, and this was an unusual setting. For the most part, we're working with people who are um, you know, kind of um, the middle management, you know, managers who are working on sustainability, on human rights and whatnot, and you sort of need to give them the tools to succeed so that your sort of public advocacy doesn't cut them down, um, but you also sort of need to get through. And I think, um, to an extent, arguing from facts, um, arguing with nouns and verbs as opposed to adjectives and adverbs um, is a way to be able to sort of make your point and have the conversation um, and not back down from what you're asking for, but sort of, you know, be able to make it in a way that the um, points will get through. Thank you. Um, so the, the other thing that I noticed from, from the story that you're telling is that it, it was a coalition of actors that, that sort of coordinated almost in... Uh, with like different registers and ways in which they um, they spoke with the company, uh, can you tell us a little about putting together the right kind of coalition? Yeah, I think you you um, always need more people. <laughs> I think that that a diversity of voices um, uh, can succeed in ways that are you know really sort of you know um, beyond belief. Uh, I, you, we had an issue that cut across. Um, political lines in the United States. Like I said, our, our legislation was initially supported by, uh, the, I think the first bill on conflict minerals was proposed by Sam Brownback, who's a very conservative uh, you know, Christian um, uh, senator at the time. Um, and so you know, we were able to bring together kind of faith-based groups, student groups, um, and um, you know, it wasn't about building sort of like, it wasn't about getting everyone across the country to care about this issue, but it was kind of building a kind of working coalition that could sort of reach across and kind of make an influence. Um, 
I will say that I think it can be a challenge. There's in both for, in the digital rights space uh, and and on kind of digital rights issues. Um, I think there's both a um, an advantage and a challenge right now. Uh, the advantage is that because um, people who use technology, technologists and programmers and you know system administrators and whatnot, make for a natural coalition who understand the sort of challenges that are coming down the road when it comes to digital rights issues. But communicating those issues out to the wider, wider world can be challenging. Uh, and I think we often sort of wind up with, you know, kind of either it's, you know, super libertarians and, you know, uh, super left-wing folks, and it's hard to get sometimes the importance of digital rights issues to resonate with that wider group. And I think that's something I, I want to work on, and I think we all can, can work on. Speaking of, so this is, this is almost like a transition into JNI, um, which you described a little, little bit in the beginning. But uh, so, so my next question is going to be about secrecy and, and safe spaces, which you flagged as, as you were telling the story. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about GNI from the point of view of secrecy and safe spaces. Sure, yeah. So the uh, Global Network Initiative, GNI, um, we bring together our members. Uh, and so there's a set of obligations for companies. There is a um, assessment process that verifies that companies are meeting those obligations, which is are really about integrating uh, human rights and freedom of expression and privacy into their business operations and being able to um, uh, uh, when they receive a request from the government to take down content or to hand over user data, um, to do everything they can to um, resist those requests when they're overbroad. Um, and then we provide a space for learning um, because uh, the issues in the digital rights space, there's something new in the newspaper every single day. Um, so you need to provide a space where the companies can learn together with NGOs and academics and investors. Uh, and then we work together on policy change um, to try to change laws around the world that are inconsistent with international human rights standards. Um, aspects of GNI are very secret, and it's kind of a um, it's a feature rather than a bug. Um, the assessment process uh, that looks at whether companies are meeting their commitments under GNI is confidential. Um, it's reviewed by our board of directors, uh, including folks like Jim Mai. Yes, um, uh, but it is the reports themselves are not made public. Uh, we do a public report that has a lot of anonymized and aggregated da data. Um, it um, the challenge we have is on the one hand, you know, it's hard uh, to sort of demonstrate impact when things are confidential. Um, on the other hand, when you're talking about how a company can do things to keep a government from getting access to their data, you don't want to publicize that too much because then you're giving the government a roadmap to how to get around uh, the things that the company is doing to resist that. Um, so it, it, it's a challenge and a tension, and we try to find ways to be more transparent about the work that we do um, while recognizing that uh, confidentiality and uh, safe space is kind of built into it. I've been reading about the GNI and, and the Buckman Klein Center's role about in, in setting it up. And so it's, it's been really interesting watching the organization from the inside. I, I wonder if there's a way in which you can describe to everyone here a couple of ways in which you felt that GNI had impact that yeah. are discussable. <laughs> so um, I think we have impact in a few different ways. Um, so uh, one, sort of um, GNI has impact when more companies um, join GNI and sign up and make a public commitment to freedom of expression and privacy. Uh, when GNI started uh, in 2008, 10 years ago, um, the three founding companies were Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo. Uh, 20 of the founding 22 organizations were headquartered in the United States. So it was the global network initiative in name and aspiration, not in fact. Um, and today we have about 60 members, uh, half of which are from uh, headquartered outside of the United States, um, uh, including uh, companies, a lot of mobile network operators based in Europe but operating everywhere, um, academics and NGOs from Latin America, from Africa, from South Asia. Um, last week we um, welcomed a new observer company, uh, Line Corporation, who are a Japanese company that provide a messaging service that's popular in all parts of Asia. Um, so as we grow uh, and more companies kind of make these commitments, those commitments cover a wider set of users of ICT products and services around the world. Um, we can make a difference when we work together on learning and policy. Um, I think there are issues that GNI has helped to sort of put on the agenda, um, such as the sort of 
you know, pro proliferating number of instances of internet shutdowns. We saw a very, we've seen a very vivid example of that and just how difficult those are, um, but how companies can work together with other groups on that. Um, but ultimately, like the rubber hits the road when companies take steps to protect their users by implementing our sort of principles and guidelines um, and by resisting sort of government demands. Um, and a lot of that is uh, stuff that will never get talked about, um, but I think occasionally it does. And last week, I think um, Brad Smith from Microsoft uh, made some comments and talked about how uh, Microsoft was not providing um, AI for uh, several kind of applications and not selling to folks, whether it was, I think, police in the United States in one case or um, to a, uh, an actor in a, um, you know, unfree uh, state, according to Freedom House. Um, so th that's where the rubber hits the road, but that's often the hardest things to talk about. This is true. GNI has been such an interesting model and such a success in, in, in the ways in which you described. But the, the tech world has also changed since it was set up and since the principles were drafted. Yeah. And so if you had to think about the challenges um, for an organization like GNI with all the issues that are emerging, how, how would you describe them? Well, I think, um, so GNI is... Uh, focused on freedom of expression and privacy, and sort of privacy with regard to government demands for data. It was it was created to solve the challenges uh, that happened in the mid 2000s as Western technology companies went into places like China and found themselves having to comply with local laws that were inconsistent with international human rights standards. Um, so it was about trying to figure out ways that uh, companies can take down as little information as possible, hand over as little data as possible. Those issues are still very much, you know, kind of in the headlines and of great concern. Um, but there's this whole wider set of challenges now. Uh, and increasingly, I think people are looking at whether it's um, hate speech, harassment, terrorist content, um, you name the issue. Um, there's a lot more, well, you know, we want you to take down this content because this content is harmful or may harm someone's, you know, rights. Um, but we don't want you to take down this other information because we want you to respect freedom of expression and privacy. That's a really hard challenge. Um, and I think that, you know, all of us need to be sort of engaged in figuring out the right thing. I think that the multi-stakeholder kind of model that GNI uses is one tool uh, in, the, in the tool belt of, you know, kind of ways of working with companies on digital rights, but there, there are many others from legislation and regulation um, to, you know, kind of all sorts of other ways of, of sort of organizing and thinking about these things. But I think it's a much harder problem, and as technology develops, it's only going to get more and more difficult as you look at things like artificial intelligence. Thank you. So I will not monopolize David. I'm just going to stop here and say that it's been such a privilege both speaking with you and getting to watch TNI and learn from the inside. Um, back to you, Jess. I'm sure everyone else has questions. Yes, sir, I know there's a lot of expertise around these issues in the room. Thanks. Uh, that was a great talk. I just have a quick question. How is what you're doing with tech companies uh, in Eastern DRC? different from the Kimberley process. And I ask this because we were sold the same narrative with the Kimberley process, and everybody took advantage of it, and we're back to square one. So yeah. what are the lessons learned from that process to ensure that this actually makes sense? Yeah, it's, um, it's a very good question. So the Kimberley process was created to address the issue of conflict diamonds uh, in um, the uh, early 2000s, I think. Um, uh, and that was one of several examples that we sort of looked at when we were starting to figure out how can we address this issue of minerals in Eastern Congo. So we looked at things like the Kimberley process. We looked at uh, work around labor rights and labor conditions. Um, we looked at things like the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Uh, and so in particular with the Kimberley process, um, of which I'm not an expert, I believe that is entirely a governmental Organization. So governments are the only ones at the table um, who are formal members. If I'm not mistaken, I could be mistaken. Um, and it is dedicated to deal with one, uh, the issue of kind of rebel groups um, or um, non-state actors um, dealing in these kinds of resources. Uh, and it was, it, it, it did not address the issue of say, um, elements of the army or, or secure state security actors dealing with those 
um, uh, diamonds. Um, so there were some institutional flaws there. Um, we tried to sort of correct for that in what we were proposing and what we did together with many, many, many other organizations, other NGOs, UN experts, et cetera. Um, and these things are always a work in progress. I was looking you know, yesterday at a recent report from an organization that's been monitoring the situation on the ground. Um, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's a constant work in progress. You have these um, mechanisms set up to validate mines uh, on the ground in parts of Eastern Congo, and you always have people trying to game the system. Um, but um, the latest that I've seen seems to be that you know, these kinds of responsible sourcing initiatives um, are making progress, but it, it's always kind of a two steps forward, one step back situation. taken on a couple of different roles. You know, your role at Enough was very different from the role that you have um, on the staff of GNI with the sort of attendant confidential spaces that GNI creates. We have a lot of students in the room who are perhaps thinking about careers in this space. Could you talk a little bit about the dynamics of working in those different roles and the advantages and disadvantages of each and what might have led you to a space like yeah. GNI? Um, uh, Sure, yeah, no, when I um, first started working with companies, I kind of I went to a meeting of this industry association uh, uh, when it was meeting in Washington, and I got to be the person who comes in from civil society and pounds on the table and says, you know, blood is on your hands, you have to do something about this. Um, and that's, you know, it's fun, but <laughs> ultimately, you know, there are many different ways uh, to uh, make a difference. Um, and what I found from my work um, on Congo was while Ultimately, there's only so much you can do to sort of, when you're, you know, dealing with a, you know, leader of a rebel group or a, you know, army units in Eastern Congo, you don't have the leverage that you have when you're dealing with uh, large companies. Uh, and so, you know, there's an ability to sort of work with them uh, to try to achieve effects sort of back through the supply chain um, that was appealing to me and which led me to my role in GNI, which is much more sitting in the middle and being a facilitator and trying to figure out ways for everybody to kind of work together um, to create solutions. And that can be challenging as well because, you know, you don't always, uh, you know, it's both difficult when people ask, you know, sort of critical questions about what you're doing, um, uh, but to be like, no, I'm kind of uh, an arbiter. But I think that for students, you know, there are, there's no shortage of, I wish that, you know, kind of business and human rights wasn't a growth industry <laughs> because that would mean maybe we're sort of solving some of these problems and, and, and often they're just proliferating. But I think there are roles, whether it's within companies, for NGOs, and within government. I mean, I think that, you know, you sort of, the approach of sort of teaming, teaming up between civil society and government to sort of work on companies and working, teaming up civil society and uh, companies to work on government, um, those kinds of uh, forging those connections and alliances can, is a way to make a difference. Other questions, yeah. In most of your talk, you were talking about tech companies and coordinations of responses among tech companies, but I had some questions about that slide you put up at the very end, because at the top were, you know, Microsoft, Intel, Apple, so on. At the yeah. bottom, you had a bunch of general merchandisers like Sears, Walmart, uh, uh, yeah. Costco. I was wondering, like, why, how are these two things related to each other, and like, why were they on the same list? And the, and the other question is, if Costco is a company that's doing really badly, um, they, they pride themselves on being socially responsible, and it seems like they ought to be approachable on this. Yeah. Um, so those companies are on that list because that 2017 ranking was looking at um, the jewelry industry as well as electronics. Uh, and uh, Costco and Walmart and folks like that are actually the, the biggest, some of the biggest jewelers uh, uh, in the United States. Um, and um, uh, it's, but it's a really good question because uh, we sort of went at the, um, the tech companies and the electronics companies, um, but you know, these um, products are used in, these minerals and metals are used in everything. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting when we were pushing for this legislation um, because we had sort of spent a year and a half engaging with the tech companies. Um, so many of them were sort of supportive, more or less, of a legislative approach, said we need kind of common rules for everyone. Um, and, um, uh, and so we, were, we found a way to work together on legislation. Then when the bill was kind of moving forward, when it got rolled into the... Um, 
Dodd-Frank Act, the rest of industry sort of woke up. Uh, and so the National Association of Manufacturers and the Chamber of Commerce and all of these folks were like, whoa, we gotta stop this. And they, they have been um, the most prominent um, kind of uh, groups calling for both to first stop the legislation, then uh, stop the rulemaking process, then uh, lawsuits uh, and uh, have continued to fight it. But the companies that sort of were involved from the beginning and were most kind of, um, had, had taken the heat were ones who then saw a positive um, uh, aspect to it. And interestingly, uh, in the past few years, I'm not sure where it stands right now, but efforts by the Trump administration to either defund or get rid of the legislation um, have been opposed, including by uh, technology companies like Apple, who've actually engaged with the government to say, no, we need this. Um, I'm sure that my former colleagues from the NF Project have been in touch with them, but I will, I will find out. All right, we have a question in the front moment. <clears throat> um, thank you. One thing that struck me about the tale you retold is that there was no, as, as kind of a complete outsider to this work, um, no mention of a bottom line. So is that something that people actually don't care about? Steve Jobs is much more concerned with his attention, or are these just veiled ways of talking about the bottom line? So... Um, uh, very good question. Um, and uh, it was one, I think, early on, there was kind of an assumption that there's no way that, that it would be too expensive for companies to really kind of, um, you know, tr do this kind of supply chain tracing and audibility. And um, uh, the more we looked into it, apparently that was not so much the case. And it actually was only, you know, a couple of pennies per product or something like that that would have would have taken. Um, so, uh, but I do think that the the... The push from the bottom line, uh, which is what has led to global supply chains being what they are, with sort of things being produced as fast and as cheaply as possible, sort of led to this situation in the first place. Uh, and I think sort of awareness, um, you know, once you, uh, I think oftentimes the solutions to these things may actually be less expensive than people think they are, but it's what, what is expensive, uh, you know, in terms of social cost is sort of get everything as fast and as cheap as possible. Thank you. Uh, get around to Iran. Then I have another question for you. Thank you for the presentation and, and, and the guidelines that you offered. Um, so given the intricacies of uh, issues like hate speech and the significance of um, um, the contextual problems and the history, can you talk a little bit about what mechanisms are in place in GNI um, to make sure that you understand all the dimensions of the problems and, and how you interact with local groups? So um, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, so we, you know, our kind of expertise and insight into these issues comes via our members, um, uh, and in particular, the human rights organizations and academics who are working on them. Um, and it is uneven uh, because uh, the level of expertise on all of the different local situations around the world, um, you know, uh, comes up to our, you know, organization unevenly. Um, I, we are, I think, one of our highest priorities right now is to like fully globalize the Global Network Initiative and to make sure that we have members, both companies and non-company members, from all over the world. Uh, and that is, you know, we're making progress, but we still have a long way uh, to go uh, in that regard. Um, we are out there sort of trying to um, meet with people and sort of learn and listen and hear. Uh, my colleague, uh, Nikki, who was previously at the Berkman Klein Center, was in Lagos uh, today doing a round table with uh, companies and civil society organizations. Uh, we're gonna be at RightsCon in Tunisia uh, in a few months. Um, so we try to get out there and to hear from people. Um, one challenge we have uh, that we're working on, so multi-stakeholder initiatives like GNI, um, according to the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and just good practice, um, need to have kind of public engagement mechanisms and grievance mechanisms so that if someone feels like they, you know, um, have been wrongly impacted or have something to say to us that they can get through to us. Um, that's a harder problem to solve in the sort of digital space than it is offline where, you know, if you look at a mining community, well, there's the affected community is the people who live around that mine and you can go and talk to them. Uh, and uh, creating those channels when you're talking about a company with billions of users um, is a problem that we're 
trying to solve, uh, and, but, um, and where we could use help. So my follow-up um, to Aaron's great question is, um, what observations do you have, and I'm interested in David's answer to this question, but also Chin Mai's answer to this question, um, representing first CCG um, uh, at GNI and now um, as an independent academic, um, as GNI has begun to globalize, how has that changed the organization? Um, well, it, it's, um, it's been incredibly valuable. We now have you know, academic and NGO members from Chile and Argentina and um, Nigeria and uh, Uganda and uh, India and South Korea. Um, uh, we need to evolve. So G and I, you know, when it started, uh, it, the organization was the founders who were the board of directors who were a largely American group of people who'd been meeting in conference rooms in the West over a couple of years and had become to be very good friends and had sort of developed trust uh, among them that allowed them to tackle really difficult uh, topics and difficult conversations. Um, bringing people, uh, other people into that is essential because it's kind of myopic to think that, that those people can sort of do it on their own. Um, so we've been trying to bring uh, uh, groups from the rest of the world into GNI. Um, that uh, can be a challenge. It can be a challenge for like just logistical purposes. You know, you trying to schedule calls at a time zone that works for everyone doesn't work very well. And so people who are calling in from Delhi are at a disadvantage. Um, and uh, there's sort of ways that we kind of work together and interact and communicate that need to be sort of updated to be sort of more inclusive and reflect diverse voices. And so those are the things that we're thinking about right now. But I'm curious. Uh, to get your perspective, Jimmy. It, it's been super interesting for me. Because we, we joined GNI, I think, in 2013 or 14 with Berkman's support, actually. Um, and initially, it was great. It was well worth getting on a call at 1 AM because we, <laughs> <laughs> we would, you know, it would be one hour's like, deep dive into an issue that I didn't even know was an issue. And then I'd know all about it by the time everyone in India woke up to the fact that this is a thing. Um, and so it was fantastic as, as, we, as we were leading into this, uh, as we were sort of uh, getting into the space, the, um, the learning and development. But then, um, as David described, there's, there's also a board, and, and GNI has been diversifying its board. And that's been great, too, because over time, that means that you build relationships, because you have to, with people from everywhere. We've been supported quite a lot by um, all the board members. It's been great to have friends like Jess on the board with us. Um, and so I, I imagine that like most things, it takes time before the relationships form again. But I can see them happening, and I can see everyone working towards them happening. So it's been good. I, I think from our point of view, so sometimes the way in which a human rights issue can impact a global south country can be completely different from the way in which it works here. And if you speak with activists or with academics from the global south, our take on what needs to be done can be completely different. And I'm not saying right, I'm just saying different. And so it's been great because we have this conversation and we start to understand what the, the challenges of working at it from the north or from within a company are. Um, and they start to understand why it is that we're so agitated about the issue. And I think that the common ground is definitely a better common ground than when we're not talking. We have time for one more question, Hillary. Oh, we'll do two. We'll get Hillary and Sabella. <laughs> Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm curious, as we're seeing a lot of internal organizing at tech companies right now, yeah. how you see that there should be connections or maybe shouldn't be connections or when it makes sense to work with or, um, organizers internally. Yeah. Do you want to stack the two questions and then you can put them together? I have a similar question to what Hillary said and what um, this Erin said, um, you had mentioned that uh, when it comes to the conflict minerals, it was, uh, you initially thought it would be an expensive process, but it was actually cheaper than you thought. And uh, I think I've heard some of the feedback from companies like Facebook that to hire people to monitor content or to create AI to filter through the hate speech is very expensive. So do you have any ideas on how you can sort of um, uh, deal with that argument or somehow lower the cost? through technology or some other means? Um, so both great questions. I think in terms of um, the activism among tech uh, 
um, the activism among tech workers uh, is a really uh, kind of inspiring and encouraging thing. I think that for folks inside a company, they can use the sort of external commitments that a company has made um, to hold their company to those points. And so that can be a tool. Um, it may not always make sense to sort of you know, work together, but I think things can still sort of push in the same direction. Um, and I think, um, you know, when it comes to the costs, um, I think companies can afford a lot of these things. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, it takes particularly the sort of technical uh, experts from outside of uh, companies, whether it's academia and elsewhere, um, to be able to argue these things uh, based on uh, their own expertise and to push back and to make sure that, you know, you understand that what the real challenges are. And those may be difficult, and they may take resources. Um, I'm per personally a little skeptical of AI's ability to solve things that depend so much on context as hate speech uh, and, and things like that. I think that needs people and a lot more people. Um, but um, I think that um, making that case is something that you know, we all have to do. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Chin Mai, for your role as a discussant, and thank you all for being here with us today. I'm sure David will stick around for a little bit if you have one-on-one -on -one questions, but join me in uh, thanking our, our speaker. <laughs>